Living in New York City is expensive and sometimes it can be challenging to afford even the basic necessities such as clothing and furniture. Did you know that you may be eligible for funding to help offset the cost of certain items for your loved one with an intellectual or developmental disability? The Family Reimbursement Program at Adapt Community Network is here to help. Give us a call today at 1-877-827-2666 to see if you qualify. Hello and welcome to ADAPT Community Network's 2021 Virtual Family Connect Summit. We are so pleased that you can join us. This is session F, promoting regular sleep patterns in individuals with autism, and our session will begin shortly following this brief introduction. My name is Tracy Papar, and I am the Vice President of Family Support Services here at ADAPT Community Network. ADAPT is a nonprofit provider of an array of services for children, teens, and adults with intellectual or developmental disabilities who live across the five boroughs of New York City. To learn more about our range of services, please call Project Connect, our information and referral line at 877-827-2666. During this session, our presenter will discuss some common barriers to sleep and a variety of issues that may occur, from difficulty falling asleep to staying asleep to sleeping in the parent's bed against the parent's wishes. There will be a review of proactive strategies and interventions to promote regular sleep patterns. Our presenter is Dr. Mary McDonald, a professor in the Special Education Department at Hofstra University. She directs the advanced service programs, including the advanced certificate in ABA and the advanced certificate in severe and multiple disabilities. Dr. McDonald is also the Associate Executive Director of Long Island Programs for Eden 2 slash Genesis. She has over 30 years of experience directing programs for students with autism from early intervention through adulthood. After this session, we encourage you to submit your questions by emailing them to projectconnect at adaptcommunitynetwork.org. We hope you enjoy the session. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. We will be focusing on promoting regular sleep patterns in individuals with autism today. I am sure you can all agree with me that promoting sleep is always going to be an area of importance, whether it's for our children, for ourselves, for children with autism, for adults with autism. We all need our sleep, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. All right, so of course, it's a little different than having an interactive audience, so I can't really ask you to respond to me in the way that I might normally do, but I would like you to think a little bit as we go through the presentation today about your own sleep behavior and some of your own sleep patterns and you know you may actually get something out of this for yourself or a close family member as well today so i just want to start out by saying that you know sleep is a behavior and we're going to think about that we're going to talk about what that means and it's actually a good thing because it means that we can work on this this does not have to be something where people just sort of have to live with it, which is sometimes I think how people feel. So it can be observed, it can be measured, it can be reported, and I'm gonna show you some examples of that today. And um, it can occur across the lifetime. So you may have a child with autism who's three years old, who you're having a lot of difficulty with in terms of sleep. You may have an adult with autism who's having some of these difficulties with sleep and you yourself may have some difficulties with sleep. So it's certainly something that we can all relate to. There are some things that affect our sleep. So one is uh, anything medical. So maybe someone has sleep apnea, they're on a particular medication, they change medications. Maybe they have night terrors or they're not feeling well. There's just many, many um, medical issues, certainly any sort of pain or chronic pain, anything like that, any sort of injury can all affect our sleep. And I'm sure you've all experienced some of these things from time to time. There's also a whole other category of anxiety. And some people have a lot of worries and, and some people have actual clinical anxiety. 
And so people may worry at bedtime, they may not be able to fall asleep, they may wake up during the night and start to think about some of these things. And so this is also going to affect our sleep. The environment itself, you probably have uh, thought about this, I'm sure for yourself, you know, which blanket should I use? You know, what's the air conditioning on? Which shade should I put on my window to keep it dark enough for me to sleep? But all of these things make a difference. And then our own personal habits of things like diet and exercise and our general wellness can affect our sleep as well. There is a very helpful book, it's called Sleep Better. And this is written by the author, Mark Durand. If you are interested in learning more about this topic, this is definitely a go-to resource. I highly recommend it. I've used it many times uh, with students that I've worked with and I have found it to be incredibly helpful. And many of the strategies that we'll talk about today, you will recognize if you do get this book because we do take some of the treatment implications from here. This is also a good place to start if you are interested in actually looking at a research article. I'm going to share this particular reference with you. It's just a good place to start. It, it's not um, really too difficult of a read, but it does give some overall information about sleep problems and autism and some of the reasons and some different interventions as well. So it might be an interesting place also to get some information and resources. What do we know? You know, what do we know about sleep and children with autism um, and adults with autism? Well, the truth is there's a lot more research that's needed in this area. And it can be very stressful for families, I'm sure. You know, if you are the families out here listening to this today, you understand and you know why you chose this topic. About 30% of preschool children who are typically developing have some sort of sleep problems, but they typically improve as they move through childhood. But for children with autism, rates are reported between 44 and 83%, which is not only more than typically developing children, not only does it also continue and not necessarily improve as it does in other children, but it's also more than um, children with other disabilities. And it also can occur across all IQ levels. So sometimes people might think, well, if my child is, you know, what people use the term, which I don't love, but, you know, maybe higher functioning, or they might talk about a child being more verbal or something like that. You know, does that affect anything? Would they be more or less likely to have these issues? And it really is not the case. Um, most of the difficulty happens to come with the sleep onset. So just kind of falling asleep when the child first goes into bed and then maintaining sleep, being able to stay asleep and not waking up. So we're going to talk more about all of that. Um, I only have a short time to present to you here today, so I'm going to go through some of these things and just provide an overview, but I gave my email address on the slides, and you can feel free to contact me and I can share information with you um, and have further conversation as well. So, of course, you know, as I said, this can continue as they get older, but you could still have these sleep issues. So what about um, the child who maybe refuses to go to bed, right? And they start crying and they have some sort of outburst at bedtime. So some children might, some parents might use a procedure with their children called extinction. So the parents ignore the behavior and they direct the child to bed. But this tends to be usually very difficult for most parents because it's really probably one of the most difficult things in the world is to hear your own child crying and screaming. There's just something about it that's different than hearing any other child crying or screaming. And that's why it's so much easier for teachers and clinicians to help with these kinds of plans very often, rather than the parent themselves sometimes to implement it because it can be very challenging. One thing that you need to know as a parent is that it's, it's really something that you have to decide that you're ready for before you start to really attempt a sleep plan because it's obviously difficult um, emotionally, it can be stressful and it can be overwhelming and time consuming and it can also increase your lack of sleep for a period of time while you're working it out. So just something to think about. Uh, sometimes graduated extinction is used. So the parent ignores the behavior for specified periods of time, but still goes in and checks on the child intermittently. Often parents feel better um, very often with this procedure versus sort of the regular extinction procedure because it allows you to check on your child and we're always concerned for our children and their welfare. So I understand why this might be a choice, but we'll talk more about some specific um, interventions as we move into some of the, you know, real sleep issues as we go. 
So I have heard a lot of times people say things like, well, just let them go back to sleep. And these are famous words said by an exhausted parent, right? What's the scenario here? What do you think is happening when you hear someone say that? Well, what I think happens very often is the parents are very, very stressed and very overwhelmed and they just want to sleep. And when we want to sleep, we'll agree to almost anything at that point, right? We are exhausted. We're falling asleep at work. You know, we can't function, we can't think, and we're just tired and we need some sleep. So we decide that maybe we'll have the child sleep in the bed with us, okay? Now, some people may have chosen to do that and you may have done that because you actually made that choice as a family to do that. And if that is the case, then I absolutely support your decision in that. That's different. Um, culturally, you may have decided that this is you know, something that you do as part of your culture. Again, completely different and that's your choice. And then that's, that's what you plan to do. In this scenario, this is a scenario where people did not plan to do that but they do it in response to the child's sort of sleep behavior. And this is not what the parents are looking to have happen. And, and they may not realize that it could turn into a larger problem. And especially when you see a beautiful picture like this with this adorable little baby, you think, well, what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, what can go wrong is that, is number one is that the child's not sleeping. So now you fall asleep and now you have this unattended baby in the bed. So there's already some possible safety issues um, with young children and even with children with autism really at any age to some degree possibly, right? So something to think about. The other issue is that the child grows up. And what I have found very often working with parents of children with autism is that when I meet the families or when the families finally um, are ready to talk about the sleep behavior, or really discuss and open up about you know, the issues that they're having, I find that the children are older very often. And so I have worked with families where children are nine years old and 10 years old and 12 years old, and maybe even 14 and 15, et cetera. And they are sleeping in their parents', parents bed. And it's something that started sometimes at a young age and it just kind of continued and snowballed and it was just the easier path or so it seemed when it started, right? So then it could start to look like this. And again, if this is what you're looking for in your family, then that's totally fine and I support you. But if you're not, then it's something that we can certainly talk about more to try to help to develop a plan for. So of course, behavior during the day can affect people's sleep patterns at night. We see that in ourselves, right? And people can have that more energetic behavior during the day, but you know, we may also see some sleep difficulties. Some higher scores on the autism rating scale have been associated with some shorter sleep schedules. So there may be some effect there and a lack of sleep um, can affect daytime behavior as well. We mentioned how we can all be affected, our memory, our learning, all of those kinds of things. And for children with autism, I have also seen specifically that they may engage in some challenging behavior due to lack of sleep. And we, when we've actually been able to address the sleep, we've actually seen um, a large decrease in some of those behaviors. And some of those behaviors may even be um, behaviors like aggression. And if you think about it, it's not so surprising because imagine yourself with your lack of sleep um, or your lack of sleep and not having your coffee yet and imagine the mood that you might feel. And when someone asks you a simple question that you might have responded to, you know, sort of fine in the past, now maybe you're not responding to so fine. So all kinds of things to think about. So some causes of sleep issues. Well, you know, social behavior is an interesting whole other area to think about for children with autism, but social behavior can actually have an effect on circadian rhythm and routines and social cues are, are believed to help infants develop these very stable sleep and wake patterns, which of course in infants we're always looking for, right? And it's the same for children with autism. Melatonin levels in children with autism may be reduced or they may be elevated. So they may not be at an optimal level. And that's also involved in the circadian rhythm, which helps to have a stable you know, sleep and wake pattern. They may be more easily awoken. So there's that sort of hyper arousal. Anxiety, as I mentioned, could be an issue. And some of the sleep EEG research is starting to note some differences between people with autism. Um, and people without autism, and this may help them to have some future research, so we'll understand more. In terms of intervention, probably about less than 50% of families actually get help. I mentioned to you that a lot of families often wait quite a long time before they really ask for help. Medication may be used, but um, parents actually reported behavioral treatment as being more effective, 
And I think that most people will probably agree that behavioral intervention, uh, setting up some sort of a plan that we'll talk about more here today, uh, would probably be a choice over medication if that's possible. We're going to begin with a history and a sleep diary. I'll talk to you more about that. We'll develop a behavioral intervention. Uh, we have to be consistent and certainly working with the family is going to be key to all of this. Um, the biggest message that I could probably give to you today is to not be afraid to ask for help. That is absolutely, absolutely 100% um, something that you should be doing and you shouldn't be afraid to do that. And I hope that you have someone that you can ask for help. And if you don't, by all means, email me and I will try to find a way to get you help. Uh, we do have a behavior clinic that I work in and we actually provide support for families who have some of these difficulties. And so maybe if you need help, maybe it's something that we can help you with, or maybe we can refer you to someone to help you. Who often initiates the idea of a sleep plan? So this is interesting. The idea typically comes from the parents, right? Because as clinicians, we don't necessarily know that there is an issue unless we see something in the child or unless you tell us. So very often it really comes from the parent, but what I find is often the conversation begins and then when the parent starts to realize what might be involved, they sort of pull back a bit. And then they're like, no, no, it's not so bad, I can handle it. And then that may go on for a few more years. So what's the biggest issue with implementation? It's consistency. You know, We just need people to be consistent with the implementation. And it's not always easy to do that. And so we'll talk about it and you'll see you know, how you feel as we go through. So is your child getting enough sleep? Here's sort of the number one question, right? And of course it varies. And that's why we have a range of hours. And even, even with the range of hours, you know that sometimes people at certain ages will say, oh, I only get five hours a night and that's just normal for me. You know, so you have to know obviously the person and you know, sort of their sleep schedule and their ability on that sleep schedule and what that really looks like. But this should give you some sense of where you might expect people to be in terms of the number of hours of sleep that you might expect them to have. One of the things that we would do if we were working on a sleep plan is we would have a family fill out a sleep diary. So of course, I'm not going to get into all the details. We don't have enough time, but basically we would explain this form and we would have the parent just record, you know, when the child falls asleep, when they wake up, how long they sleep, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, here's another example of a sleep tracker. Now, as far as some specific issues, there's difficulty falling asleep, there's waking up in the middle of the night, and then there's sleeping in parents' bed. Okay, these are the sort of main areas that we're gonna focus on today. So the first one is falling asleep. This happens to be a pretty large problem and really encompasses the majority of the issues. So there's a few things. One is bedtime routine. The other is the number of hours of sleep needed. And the last piece is the bed itself as a place to sleep. So we're going to think about these things um, a little bit here today. Unfortunately, I don't necessarily have enough time to get too far into it, but I'm going to kind of skim the surface a little bit with you. So in terms of bedtime routine, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure that children have a good bedtime routine, that it's a sequence of sort of steps and behaviors of going to sleep, and that it's the same and there's consistency in that. Okay, we want to start that routine at least a half hour before the uh, scheduled sleep time, but not too much um, longer before that, All right? So in the bedtime routine, we want to have some calming activities. Routine itself, just getting this bedtime routine sometimes actually is enough to change behavior in the child, you'd be surprised. We want to think about some specifics. We don't want to have snacks. We're not going to drink caffeine right before we go to bed. We're going to maybe take the child to the bathroom before they go to bed. We're going to build all those things into our routine and we're going to follow that same routine each night. Okay. How many hours of sleep does your child need? This is an important question. When you do your sleep diary, it'll help us to figure that out. So again, we're going to look at, you know, what would be sort of the ideal for a child of that age or an adult. And then we're going to look to see how many hours they're getting. And I would ask you a lot of questions about your child and maybe sleep that they used to have. Um, maybe something recently has disrupted their sleep. Oh, they used to sleep nine hours, but now they're only sleeping five, that sort of thing. And so we would get some information, but that's gonna be an important piece of our plan. So again, we'll do our sleep diary. Um, another thing is no naps. This can be difficult, not um, allowing the child to nap. Now, of course, age will be considered in this. If this is a young child and they're still napping, that would be different. But if it's an older child and they're not napping, but they're falling asleep and thereby having a nap, we're going to remove those naps. 
because that is going to keep affecting your sleep schedule. And so what will happen is they'll nap during the day, but they will not sleep for you at night. Uh, we're gonna look at those total hours slept, okay? As I said earlier. So there's something I wanna to talk to you about for a minute, and this is called an SD or a discriminative stimulus. And what it means is when you see a particular stimulus, you behave in a certain way. So when you see a red light, you stop your car. When you see a green light, you go. When you see a yellow light, people will say you're supposed to slow down and most people will say they actually speed up. But in the presence of a particular stimulus, you engage in a certain behavior. A phone's ringing, you answer it. Someone enters a room, you say hello. So we need to think about that when we think about sleep. So what's the SD to go to sleep? Okay, we don't want it to be that somebody is just, you know, in the living room and they're just sort of passing out, right? We want there to be a sequence or a stimulus or a sequence of stimuli. Um, so the bed, darkness, that routine that comes right before sleep. So all of those things can lead up to sleep and they can make it much more discriminable to a child with autism that it is time to go to sleep now. And you'd be really surprised that this adding this sort of chain can actually make such a difference. Okay, so here's some visuals just to show you an example, but it really is sort of a chain of behavior and the completion of each step leads to the next step and that leads to bedtime. If there's no clear chain, it may not be clear for the child that it's time to go to sleep. Another issue is that the bed itself should really be for sleep. So really you shouldn't have like toys, shouldn't have the child like sitting in the bed playing with toys before they go to bed and things like that so much. Um, not so bad to just have the child laying in bed and read a story to them because that's part of their routine, but you don't want them to use the bed for things other than sleep. Not so great for us as adults either to have a TV in our bedroom if we want to go to sleep. Okay. So what about waking up during the night? You know, maybe the child went to sleep too early. Maybe they don't need, you know, 12 hours of sleep. Maybe they're having bathroom uh, toileting accidents during the night and they're not waking up to go to the bathroom and then, you know, that's waking them up. That I'm gonna say is gonna become its own goal and a whole other plan. And there are things that can be done, but I'm not gonna really um, address that here today. Uh, the child is a light sleeper and they wake up, maybe there's a lot of noise in the household. Maybe it's a very busy house and family and people stay up later than the child. All of these possibilities, these would be questions that I'd be asking and trying to understand better. So I'm gonna share with you a little case study for Danny. We did an assessment. He was having difficulty uh, due to falling asleep and waking at night. Uh, we used the Albany sleep problem scale. And this gives us information about the child's sleep patterns. And we used a lot of the other tools that I had mentioned to you before. We took some baseline data by uh, starting to understand, you know, how long the child was sleeping. Very simple sleep log, nothing very complicated at all. Okay, just something to get some information. And then also looking to see if there's any behavior as well happening at sleep time. We had the family fill out a sleep diary. Okay, and we looked at the bedtime routine and we set up a, a, a new bedtime routine and had the parents follow consistently. We did use what's called sleep restriction, which basically means that the child was kept awake later than usual so that the child was more tired and was then gone through the sleep routine and then put to bed. It just makes that whole behavior chain more consistent and the child is actually tired and will learn that I'm tired, I, fall asleep, I go into bed, I fall asleep and it becomes a whole new pattern of behavior. It's expected that the child will fall asleep quickly when put to bed, um, and the bedtime and the wake time is based on, again, the hours slept per night and the necessary time to wake up for school. So that's all really done on a very individual basis. The bedtime was then faded. So let's say the child was, the parents wanted the child to go to bed at nine o'clock, but the child was really falling asleep at you know, 10 o'clock or, and then waking up and we're not going to sleep. So we might have the child stay up till like 11 or 1130. I know it sounds very late and it feels overwhelming, but the truth is most of the time the parents aren't getting to sleep anyway. And so we do this for a short period of time. And within weeks, we're able to fade that time back and we get them to a much more reasonable bedtime. Okay, so for this particular individual during baseline, it took the child anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours and 20 minutes to fall asleep. And um, after treatment, he was falling asleep within one minute to 15 minutes at most. And this was like a great improvement. The bed was definitely becoming an SD for sleep. And this is what we're looking for. Okay, this is another, uh, another case. This is just showing you uh, some example of what a sleep plan might look like. So I'm not gonna go through all the details here, but I just wanted you to see. 
So this is someone who was waking up during the night and they just were not sleeping and we were looking to have them sleep ideally nine hours. So this is the written sleep plan. When you're working on sleep, it's nice to have a written plan that indicates all the different components, okay? So that's what this is looking at. Talks about what the bedtime might be, what the wake time might be. Um, and then eventually we're gonna shift that. This was a older, this was an adult actually. And so midnight was not so, uh, outrageous for this person, okay? And again, we're gonna look at things like the total sleep hours, the bedtime routine, we're gonna outline here in the plan specifically for this individual what that looks like. We used bedtime fading and sleep restriction procedures. So again, this details out some of the specifics here for you. I'm not gonna go through all of it in detail, but you see it here. And then we had a morning wake up procedure as well because we can't have the child or the adult not following the schedule because if we let them sleep all morning, then it messes up the schedule again for the next day. So we have to have a specific amount of hours and then be careful with that. So here's an example where we might do some fading steps just to show you what that might look like. And eventually the person is going to bed at 10 and waking at seven and they're getting their nine hours sleep, okay? Here's some sample data just to show you what it looks like. So the top graph shows you the number of hours slept before a full awakening. So during baseline in the blue on the top graph, you see that this individual was only sleeping for about four and a half to five hours. And after intervention, you're seeing they're around eight to eight and a half hours, which is amazing. Uh, the number of night awakenings, uh, this person was waking one to two times a night, but after intervention, we see that they are no longer waking. In some cases, it might be helpful to actually wake the child before their wake time. I know that this seems contraindicated. Why would I wake my child up if they're actually sleeping? But sometimes just gently rousing them from their sleep, having them sort of wake up and then fall right back to sleep actually keeps them in bed asleep. Um, so it's a little bit more of an advanced plan. It's something that you know you probably want to talk to somebody about before you did this, but it is a possibility if uh, some of the other plans are not working out. Okay, what about sleeping in the parent's bed? This does become an issue um, often for a lot of families. So let's talk about it as an issue, if it's an issue. Again, if it's not, it's not. Uh, again, following the bedtime routine, setting the bedtime, the child should be sleeping when they put to bed. If they fall asleep and then wake up and come into the bedroom, this is a specific area to address proactively, right? So there are differences. Are they starting out in the parent's bed? Are they waking up in the middle of the night coming into the parent's bed? Because that's you know, that's awakening issue, right? So we're gonna have to look at that as its own sort of sleep behavior. And if we work on that, then they may not wake up anymore and they may not come sleep in the parent's bed. So sometimes that in and of itself will solve the problem. Uh, sometimes parents will become stationed uh, or staff outside of the child's bedroom to sort of try to guide them back to their own bed if they come out of the bedroom uh, to try to keep them sleeping in their own bed. Um, some parents have gotten uh, to the point where they've actually put a lock on their own bedroom door to prevent the child from coming into their bedroom, some sort of, you know, small uh, lock or something like that. It's a pretty extreme reaction, but, you know, some parents have been sleep deprived for many, many years, and that's the point they've gotten to. And that's not what I'm looking to do. Uh, so I would rather work on it through using a behavioral intervention, okay, just for safety reasons in case a child does need to get to a parent, right? Uh, we talked about not having toys, and if needed, the parent can stay in the room with the child while they're falling asleep and then generally gradually fade out, and this is something they may need to do during the night as well. Again, sounds disruptive, sounds exhausting, but it's happening already anyway, so it's really just a matter of doing it in a way so that the problem will not be a problem any longer, and that's the difference. Okay, there are lots of different visuals that exist out there. You can certainly make your own but there are many out there that exist. If you just do a quick Google search, you'll find all kinds of things. I included a few different things in here, but you can see some things about falling asleep and staying in bed as part of someone's little reinforcement chart here. And here's one where you know, the child slept in their bed all night and they get some little tokens for doing that. Okay, and here's the choo-choo sleeping train for a young kid. So all different kinds of options, some bedtime routines. You can make all different kinds of visuals for something like that. Okay, and of course, a daily routine with just the bedtime routine on there. So the child sees that, and this is a nice visual that includes the clock for children who may not be fully uh, telling time yet or have a complete understanding of that as well. 
I do think it's important to brave the data. Um, if you are a parent and you're not familiar with that or not comfortable with that, um, you probably will be working with usually a behavior analyst um, or, or a psychologist or some sort of clinician to help you with this type of a plan, and they should be able to help you to do this. Uh, they would usually be the one probably uh, creating the graph and setting it up, and they just might ask you for some data to help them. Okay. Of course, there's an app for that. Everybody always wants to know, right? Because apps certainly make our lives a little easier. So I share a few different, um, few different apps here with you, some information about that. So Sleep Bot, Sleep Cycle, these may be helpful to you for your child. Um, just a few implications just to kind of wrap up here. Sleep can be observed, measured, and modified through a consistent individualized sleep plan. Okay, many individuals with autism do have sleep difficulties and interventions can be based very often on the use of medication or herbs to treat these behaviors, right? So sometimes people are using things like melatonin or medication, but we also know that it's a behavior and it can be treated behaviorally and parents for the most part have felt that that was actually really helpful. So you wanna rule out any other medical conditions, of course, but you may be able to do something like I've described here today, and I hope that you will. This is a helpful resource. It um, talks about some of the interventions that we talked about here today. Okay, and I want you to remember that sleep is important and it affects so many areas of functioning, including learning, behavior, and health. And really the most important thing is to plan, plan, plan. And so if you have that plan and you stick to that plan and you're consistent, I do believe you will see someone sleeping. And that's what we're looking for here today. I hope that you'll keep in touch. I share some information with you here. I am a uh, faculty member at Hofstra University in the special education department. I have my email address for you here. I also work with Eden 2 Genesis programs and the Genesis Behavior Clinic where we do work on this particular issue. So I have some information for you here along with my email address and my uh, agency website for the Behavior Clinic. And then I also share with you my personal uh, website as well. So I hope to hear from you. I hope maybe um, some of you will feel comfortable and maybe you'll email me with a question or two and I'm really happy to hear from you.